ladies, welcome. So it's a very special night tonight because God threw in an extra session. When we were planning, we thought there were only 12 and then we realized there were 13. So I'm really excited about what God has for us this evening. I've spoken just this much to Karen, but it's about prayer. And um, anybody in here struggle with their prayer life? <laughs> yeah, so um, and this, as I was praying for today and thinking about it, I, the verse from James I thought about, um, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And sometimes we just think that the righteousness is supposed to be dependent upon ourselves. If I just do the right thing, if I'm more holy, if I'm more obedient, more joyful, whatever, but how are we made righteous? Only through Christ. So every believer is a righteous person whose fervent prayer can avail much. And that's what we're going to be um, learning about tonight. So we're super excited. So let's start with prayer and just get our hearts and our ears attuned to what the Lord has for us. Heavenly Father, we just bow before you in awe that you love us so, that you're so gracious and tender in your mercies towards us, that you desire intimate fellowship with us, and that you've made the way for your son so that we can come into your presence, and how you desire to commune with us and set us apart unto your own, for your own purposes and for your glory. And so tonight, God, we pray that you would fall Holy Spirit on us, meet us in this place, empower our sweet sister, with your words of truth and prepare our hearts to receive and to respond god we desire to be fervent prayers for our righteousness is in christ in christ alone and you have made the way that we can be a prayer that happens for your purpose and your glory so meet us here accomplish your purpose and your glory tonight we pray and we trust you for all of that in jesus name Amen. Karen! <laughs> so, uh, Jerry said we kind of kind of ended up with a hole in um, our lessons, and so I kind of was working on it, had something planned and everything, and then last Friday I started looking over it, and God was like, yeah, no, not that. <laughs> so I completely, completely rewrote it, and, you know, Cliff on Friday night was like, well, you want to do something? I'm like, nope, 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 <laughs> no, I'm right. <laughs> and so it just, like, poured out of me, and it was like I was in the right place, but I had a different lesson, so I, I love it when God does that, because I know that he's speaking. And so, um, anyway, I... Uh, so we're going to talk about Esther 4 and 5, the end of 4 and 5 again. And um, so just to kind of set up, you know, when, G, uh, when Jesus was here on earth for those three years, he spent a whole lot of his time pulling away from activities, pulling away from uh, people, pulling away from situations. And he would just like disappear. And he would go off into the mountains and he would pray. And uh, it's like the, the disciples, you know, all these people were looking for him. And he's like, where's Jesus? And he's like, he's gone. I mean, where'd he go? And it's like in Luke chapter 5, it said that he often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And that word often stuck out, stuck out to me. And it's because he did it a lot, enough that it was noticeable to the disciples to the point where in Luke chapter 11, one of the disciples comes up to him and he's like, can you teach us how to pray? And so it was so obvious to him that there was something different going on in his prayer life that they were going... Uh, you know, this is not what we're doing. This is different than anything we've ever seen in prayer. And it's really significant that nowhere do they ever ask him, can you teach us how to share the gospel? Can you teach us how to be good preachers? Can you teach us how to serve or anything like that? But they do say, can you teach us how to pray? And um, that's the context for, for, for what he goes on and tells us about what we call the Lord's Prayer. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, he spends a lot of time talking about prayer in in the course of uh, four verses, he says this phrase. He says, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. And then down below that, he talks about fasting. And the phrase he used there is, when you fast, when you fast. So the implication is what? Not if you pray, but when you pray. So it is expected that we should be praying and fasting as a regular and normal part of our Christian life. Jesus said, when you do it. This is what, how you, what you, you should include. And so that kind of comes back into focus when we come around the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Esther. So I want to kind of drop back and effectively do 
another sort of uh, section of application for this section before we move on, on into chapter 6 because this is the transformational moment for Esther in the character and how she is, interacts in the story. Because before this, she's fearful, she's told what to do, she just kind of follows whatever Mordecai tells her to do. And after this, she's assertive, she's given the instruction, she takes an active part in it, in the unfolding of the event. So she's basically a changed person from the end of four to five and on to the end of the whole story. And I think what we really see in her will really help us embrace prayer and even fasting as part of our lives. And so I want to spend our time talking about that tonight and then discussing it in our group. So, um, so it doesn't say actually that she prayed here, but it's definitely implied. We talked about that a little bit last week where the Jews fasting and prayer went together. It was in hand in hand. And this is really the first expression of any kind of faith we see in Esther's life at this point. Now for Mordecai, that seems to be part of his, his whole uh, part of the story here, uh, his unwillingness to bow to Haman is the thing that set off the whole conflict. And it even says in there, it's because he was a Jew that he wouldn't bow. And then you see him tearing his clothes and going into uh, mourning and fast, fasting uh, 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 over the edict that Haman has, has put out. But until now, we don't see really any of that kind of action or that kind of expression of faith in Esther's life until this moment. So the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, there's a change of directions for the rest of the story, this transitional moment for her, and uh, I thought it'd be good for us to spend some time talking about that. Now, I know some of you are real prayer warriors, and that that's the first thing you think whenever any crisis comes is to stop, let's pray. I know that. I've been, been in and around some of you, uh, and I also know that there's some other people who are more like what Sandy said, who is that they struggle a little bit with prayer and you know you have a more tenuous relationship with it you know you struggle with what to pray and how long to pray and even the purpose of prayer and I know that because I'm one of you <laughs> and it's like I have a long and complicated history many many years of struggling over um, how to pray and how it all works but um, and there's even still moments today when it's harder than it should be and I think in the midst of even questions and our concerns and our wrestlings, I don't think you can really overstate the importance of prayer. Uh, it's just all through the scriptures. Everywhere you turn, is, there's, there's emphasis on prayer. There's all kinds of New Testament verses. Pray without ceasing and cast your cares on him and bring your uh, requests to him. And uh, so it's not really up to de for debate as to whether we do it or not. And I would even probably go so far as to say that if you don't pray, it's an expression of independence from God and unbelief in God. So we need to pray. And also, according to Jesus, we need to fast as well. Um, but I don't think much of us approach crisis situations like Esther had here uh, any way like she did. We, uh, there's a lot of times that we don't consider pulling away a fervent prayer is part of what we need to do is seeking how to interact in situations or in, in conflict uh, places where there's conflict and kind of go to that as a last resort, certainly when it comes to fasting, right? So I want to talk a little bit about fasting to begin with because fasting is basically a fairly foreign uh, concept for a lot of people who um, are in, in the Western church especially, but at its most basic level, a, uh, a definition of fasting is abstaining from food for the purpose of seeking God. That's what fasting is. And we were, you know, there's a lot in the Western church where it's like, well, you can just pick whatever you want to fast from. But we were in a, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in on one of the groups, and Lynn was telling me that she heard a teaching on this, and it says it, everywhere in the Bible, except for, I think she said, one or two different places, it's always associated with food always associated with food. So sometimes we can make it more general if you want to, but at its most basic definition in the scripture, it is abstaining from food or connected to food. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's just so extreme. You know, that's only super spiritual people would do fasting, but that's actually opposite of the purpose. We don't fast because we're super spiritual. We fast because we're not. We need the spiritual insight that we don't have. And so we come to God to get it from him and for him to speak to us. And just like Esther, 
This is a complicated moment in her life. What she was going to go to Xerxes and ask for was fraught with all kinds of danger because we talked about that last time too, that she was basically asking Xerxes to say that he had made a mistake in allowing Haman to make this law. And so this proud, arrogant man could react really, really badly to this if she doesn't do it the right way, she doesn't say it the right way, she doesn't have the right venue, and so thus she calls for a three-day fast so she can get spiritual wisdom and spiritual guidance from God. Now, uh, remember, we are all made up of, uh, we're a trichotomous uh, being, body, soul, and spirit. So we're body, soul, which is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotion, and our spirit. And they're all interconnected, right? So the Holy Spirit, God, it resides in us if we're believers, and he leads us and guides us by speaking to our spirit. And our spirit, as we follow him, affects how we think, it affects our emotions, it affects our will, and that will then affects what we do with our bodies, right? And this is all, it goes the other way too. If we allow our bodies to be in control, it affects our mind, our emotion, our will, and can influence our spirit if we're not listening to God. And so it's all interconnected. So, so you can think, um, you know, if you don't think the body affects the spirit that much, be tired or sick. How well do you pray? How well do you read your Bible? How well do you hear from God when you don't feel good? So it's all interconnected. And so uh, this, this trichotomy that we are is all interwoven. So what, how does that relate to fasting? Well, fasting creates the opportunity for us to set aside bodily processes, normal bodily functions, uh, so that our soul, our mind, our will, and emotion can hear more clearly. That's the point of it. We're taking out something from here to focus this so we can hear with our spirit, right? And so it's purposely, purposefully posturing ourselves to do without for a time in order that we can draw nearer to him so that spirit part of us can be more in tune to hear from God. So food is not the issue. God is. And then in the absence of food, we take time to feast on God. That's what we're doing in fasting. Now, I'm going to say this a bunch of times on purpose, so I hope you'll hear it. So we have a lot, a lot of times there's a misunderstanding about what fasting is about. When we fast, the motive is never to try to get God to do our thing. We're not trying to impress him with doing some super spiritual thing, so he'll just, you know, we can move him off of his will onto our eyes. That's not what it is. It's always about submitting ourselves, our will, uh, with a willingness for him to change us and to lead us wherever he wants us to go, to better align our lives with his. And so we remove things uh, that we're dependent on. It allows Jesus to become our focus and become central in everything that we do. So fasting does require us to give up something for a time. Most of the time in the Bible, it's a single day fast. We have longer ones, of course, Jesus with the 40 days, but most of it is a short amount of time. Uh, but in the end, what we gain is far greater than anything that we give up, which is spiritual direction, confidence, and an understanding of God's will. So if you ever, haven't ever fasted, keep that in mind when you face a difficult situation, a crisis, or some confusing moment. It isn't that you're doing something that it, it, the extreme, extreme again to convince him to do what you want him to do. That's never going to work. We don't move him off of his will. We move to his, we move us to his will. So you set every side this thing that and if you ever uh, have done a fast, you realize just how much time is given to thinking about food, preparing food, to cleaning up for food. You have a lot of time when you're when you're fasting to give to focusing in on God. So remember, it's not as much about your stomach as it is about your ears, your spiritual ears. We're tuning them so they can allow God to guide us. And that's exactly where Esther found herself. The whole people group was about to be destroyed. This is a crisis moment. But instead of being afraid for her own safety, Mordecai gave her a new vision of herself and a new uh, uh, part that she could play in this whole drama. He basically uh, tells her, he's like, hey, you know what? This, this new thought is planted by Mordecai. He says, you know what? You have unique access to Xerxes. We can't go in and see him. We can't go in and talk to him, but he likes you. He, you know, you're the queen. You have this place that you 
you know, you can go in to see him privately and you can talk to him. And so she catches this vision for, wait, maybe I have been placed here for such a time as this. And then she begins to take action. But she doesn't just take this idea and run with it with her best, I, you know, hey, you know, you are right. I am the queen. I can go talk to him. Let me see if I can arrange something to get this ball moving. She doesn't do that. She begins where uh, we should always begin in prayer. And that Esther began in humility. Verse 16 of chapter 4 says, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my maids will fast as you do. So the first thing she does, she's not launching in, just doing what she thinks looks best. She calls for a citywide fast. And for three days, she pulls back and seeks God and asks him for direction. Uh, and I'm you know, going to go across to some New Testament verses to look at these. And the first one is James 4.10. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. And this is exactly what we see Esther do and where she starts and where we should always begin when we pray. When we, we seek God in prayer. Because prayer done right and with the right attitude is an act of humility. We come to God, we recognize his high and lofty position as far above us, and we see ourselves related him correctly. And he, you know, he's up high, we bow low. And whether you're, you know, bow on your knees, that posture that we take on our knee, our physical knees, or you're bowing on your knees in your heart, we're recognizing our position compared to his. But how many of us, when we face difficult situations, we pull back for any length of time? And we say, I need to seek God. Before I say a word to anybody, I'm going to seek God's mind. Seek God's heart, that he would tell me what to do. You know, that I would humble myself, not taking uh, the idea that I know what's going on in this situation, but we'll humble ourselves before him and let him speak to us. So, you know, we got somebody out here like, you know, we think needs to be straightened out like Xerxes needed some more information. He needed to know what was going on. She had the information he needed to know. Do we pull back for three days before we speak? How about three hours? Three minutes? <laughs> right, because many of us, we think we, need, we, need, we know what needs to be said, right? We think we are going to launch out there, take care of the situation. It's almost impossible for us to close our mouths not speaking to the situation, but say, okay, I need, I need God to lead me in this volatile situation. But Esther reminds us that, you know what, we don't often know what's going on. We don't. We are reacting what's right on the surface, and we have no idea what's going on deeper or behind it. We can't see the real issues, right? First Peter 5 says, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour Jesus talked about Satan and demons and angels throughout his ministry where he was on earth. And the Old Testament gives us lots of stories about the same things. And most of us know those truths. And if somebody was coming here and ask and say, do you believe angels and demons are real? Every one of us would probably raise our hand immediately. But in a practical, real world sort of way, we don't often act like it's true, do we? We go about our day, we bump into this thing and that thing and those people over there and this situation over here and that relationship problem and whatever. And we don't even think about that there might be something going on behind the scenes. We think we know and we don't. Our perception is skewed. It is locked here on the horizontal and we don't even think about the spiritual most of the time. But the spirit world, according to scripture, is very, very real and we act like it's not even there you know and we end up fighting the wrong battles and nothing wastes more time than messes up things more if you're fighting the wrong battle you don't even know what the right issue is peter says your enemy is just like a roaring lion looking for somebody to destroy he is on the hunt all the time not in a, if you're saved he can't touch your spirit but he can sure mess up your testimony on the earth. He can sure mess up a lot of things when we are not paying attention to what's going on. And the more in tune you are in God, with God, the more you want to know him, the, one, the more you want to follow his will, the more spiritual conflict you can expect. Remember back in Ephesians, if you were here, not, 
you know these verses probably Ephesians chapter 6 Paul tells us clearly our struggle is not against flesh and blood but it's rulers authorities powers of this dark world spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms there are evil forces working all the time and then he says therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes not if when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Verse 14 says, stand firm. So uh, what, what action are we supposed to take here? Not jump out and fight, right? Stand. Stand and stand. That's what he says here. This is a resolute determination anchored in the promises of God. Not launching out there doing what you think is best, but to stand. And the way you stand is found down in verse 18 of the same passage. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Three times. Pray, pray, pray. So the way you fight spiritual warfare is through prayer. Don't focus your attention on Satan. Don't talk to him in your prayers. Talk to God. Amen. Talk to God and put, you know, ask Him to do what needs to be done, whatever that is. So if you're, if it's a, if it's a spiritual warfare thing, God knows how to handle that. If it's not, if it's a temporary, a temporal thing, it's a fleshly thing. He knows how to handle that too. So focus your attention on God. Pray, pray, pray. So before you react, before you launch into something and make a mess of things because you don't know what really what's going on, pull back. Ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, for wisdom to see correctly. Ask for his guidance in leading you to say right words, to, 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 uh, to carry his truth into a situation. You need his mind, his direction, and his leading. So first thing she did was humility. That's the, you start with your prayer in humility. And the second thing we see in Esther here, Esther chose submission. Esther chose <coughs> submission. She is convinced that prayer and fasting is, is going to give her what she needs, but she is not presuming on God to do it the way that she wants him to do it or the way she expects. Now, you hear people all the time that they want something, and they're praying, believing, claiming victory, and all those kinds of things, but sometimes fast, and they're sometimes going even to fasting to try to convince God that, to do it what they want. That's not going to work. Uh, and sometimes they, they hook all of their faith and all of their trust in getting the outcome that they want. And what happens is when it doesn't happen, their faith crumbles. And they don't have anything left because their faith was not in God. Their faith was in a certain outcome. And so, we, and so a big part of prayer, a big part of fasting is about submission, about bringing your will in line with his will. A will. And so when she says here in verse 16, she says, when this is done, I'll go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She's seeking God, and she's leaving the results up to him, not uh, demanding that he do things her way, and she's seeking him and fasting on the front end of this process. And she opens her hands on the outcome. So she says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to seek God. If I perish, I perish. That's up to him. And so this is really hard, right? This is a really hard step because we want what we want, right? We want what we want. And most of the time we pray, when we pray, we have a preferred outcome. And we spend a lot of time telling God what that is and why it's the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, and we're not just really uh, satisfied with leaving it up to him. We're not. And uh, let's be really honest about that. I, this. I mean, there's really, is it anything that we are more committed to than our self-preservation or the preservation of our loved ones, right? We are highly motivated by that. So it's hard to get to the place where we can put them, or like Esther did here, put ourselves totally in God's hands. That's why it's difficult to pray scary prayers for our loved ones, right? Even when we know that's what we need. I mean, we're just much happier saying, God, make everything right and give them that job and make them healthy and all those kinds of things. When really what we need to sometimes pray is that, uh, especially if they're unsaved or even if they're off track and they're, Christian, they're Christians and are off track, we need to pray uh, for God to do whatever is necessary to get their attention so they turn to him. 
We know that, right? It's like, because what is a good job or a happy life if they die and go to hell, right? This all burns. Everything here burns. We need a vertical, uh, eternal look at what we're praying for people. So that when you're praying for somebody, the first thing you need to ask is, are they a Christian? Because that's going to drive how you need to pray. Okay? And, uh, so, you know, we have to seek God for these things. We have to ask God to have him help lift our focus off the here and now and on to the things that are most important, which is Christ and his kingdom. It's what we're here for. We don't need to get distracted by the things that are here on earth. And so when it comes to these crisis moments, we certainly have the privilege of asking for what we want. God is so generous. He's so merciful. He's so kind to us. He says, bring me whatever request you have. But fasting and prayer is where we learn to loosen our grip on these things and yield to God. Okay? So you know what Jesus said in his moment of crisis, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. Now, that doesn't need to just be a tack on that you stick on the end of every prayer so you've covered all the bases. But sometimes, you know, we don't know what the will of God is. And we need to come to prayer and fasting to find out. Not convince him again of our will, but uh, bring our will into subjection to his. Jesus says in the verse, he's like, you know, this is what I prefer. I prefer not shame, beating, torture, agony of bearing the sin debt of the world. If, we could, if there was a different way, that'd be great. But... Not what I want, what you want to the Father, he says. And so oftentimes discovering God's will is a long process because we have to, because he's got to move us off of what we're connected to. And part of that is coming to this point of neutrality where we can open our hands and we can say, what you want, Lord, and, um, and let him point us the direction that he wants us to go. Now we can offer our prayer preference but in the end prayer is about moving over and letting him do the deciding and sometimes we need to take a little inventory of what our prayer sounds like right we need to say what words am i actually using here how much of our prayers is devoted to god do this and to that and explaining and telling everything that we want and how much time if any is spent saying god do something in me god change me i'm the one that needs to be altered here in this situation God, show me how to operate in this situation that's really confusing to me so that your light can shine through me to whoever might see it. Equip me to handle this difficult health thing or this complicated work thing uh, in a way that others can see you in me. Give me the wisdom in this situation that I have no idea about and, and, and better equip me to minister others to be your representative, your ambassador in this situation. God not changed them, not changed it, but God changed me. God changed me. Doesn't mean you can't ask for you what you want. God is merciful. He invites us to do that. But don't make the mistake of linking the answer you want to how you judge God's faithfulness. Ask, pray, but we need to pray right alongside those prayers God, if there is something bigger going on in this situation that I, I don't know about, if you're working out a greater thing that I, ha I can't see, that isn't like anything that I would imagine, then that's okay. I submit to your will. Help me endure through this situation so that you can be glorified in it. That's where we need to get to. And that's, those are the kind of prayers God is always going to answer. He is going to answer that prayer. And, but we have to not be able to not rush ahead and try to get the, uh, make the answers happen the way we want, write our end of the story the way it is. Huge step in maturity is when we can see beyond how we want it to work out and opening our hands on what God is doing. And that's what Esther did here at the end of chapter 4. And then after prayer and after fasting, and she came to him in humility, submitted her will to him, then look at the response. Esther received the favor of God from an unlikely source. Esther received the favor of God from an unlikely source. This is where we get into chapter 5. And I chose the NASB because I like the wording here. It says, Now it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robe, stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's room. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. When the king saw Esther, the queen was the 
Esther the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. Mm -hmm. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So here's what we don't often get. Prayer and fasting, God does things that we can't do. And we can't, we can't understand. And this is what happens here. Is God started off by giving her favor with this volatile, ungodly king who's easily manipulated and makes rash decisions without thinking about them. And, and he is, had he been in the wrong mood, Esther is out. She is gone. Nobody hears from her again, and we're on to another beauty pageant, right? <laughs> because he, that's what he did with Vashti. Without just a rash decision, didn't think, you know, he was drunk. That's a big thing, too, with him. So, uh, in, but in the three days of the blank space that we talked about last time, uh, God did things that Esther couldn't possibly arrange or do herself. Here's Proverbs 21. One says, in the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. Isn't that exactly what happened there? <laughs> I mean, Debbie's before Esther got her hair out of curlers and got her best dress on. Xerxes was predisposed toward her. He was probably already thinking about her, maybe, and, and before she even showed up. So when she showed up in that inner courtroom, he's like, Esther, I was just thinking about you. And that's God working in the background, right? And I love that. That is why we don't have to major on telling God what to do in a situation. He has all the details, even the ones we can never possibly know about. He has the objective in his mind. He knows what he's going to do from the foundation of the world. He knows what part we need to play in it in the unfolding of it, how he needs to get us to where we need to be, how he needs to get those people where they need to be. He knows all of that, and he knows how to bring unusual favor from unlikely places. And that's what we see here. Uh, it, but in this, this story here, it came from the king. It came from a person. But that's not the only place that his favor comes from. And let me tell you about another place where unusual favor of God comes from that we don't like. That is weakness, and that's in difficulty. See, now normal, we say God's favor is the stuff we like, right? It's all the, you know, if, there's nobody out there who's going to say, I've got the favor of God. And then they start saying, well, I have this health issue, and the car broke down, and I lost the job, and there's conflict at home. Those are not what we look at as the favor of God, right? We think it's all the good stuff, but those are really favors from God. These are good things. But the favor of God comes in unlikely places. Now, of course... God does give us favor from the things that we like, but he also sends favor in different packaging. And the reality is that the favor of God is manifested, manifested not through human strength, but through weakness. That's just the truth that we see in the scriptures. Um, because why? When we're strong, we think we got it. We are independent. I don't need God's help. I'm good, I got it, right? That's the attitude, right? But when we feel weak, when we're broken, when we don't have it, then we're dependent on God. And that is where he works the best. Right? James 4, 6. God approaches the proud but shows what? Favor to the humble. Okay? So God always pours out his favor on the weak, the humble, the brokenness. That is when we set aside ourselves, our agenda, our plan, and we turn to him in humility and submission, like we saw with Esther. And that's just saying straight up, I can't do it, God. I need you. And as we do, he infuses us with his divine strength and his wisdom. And then it becomes apparent to everybody around that God is the one who's doing it, right? Apostle Paul learned this 100% the hard way. You know the passage on the thorn in the flesh, right? You know that one? He begged God to take that away. Three times. And then lots of prayer and fasting, I'm sure, went into that. He's like, take this away. And I'm sure he's trying to convince God, look, this is in the way of me serving you. How can I serve, plant churches and talk to people and tell them the gospel with this thing that's really hurting me, right? This, this physical uh, infirmity. But God's answer to him wasn't to take it away, but to give him the reason for it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, 
then I am strong. It's like, so, so you see there, he says, delight in weaknesses. That word delight there means think well of. And so instead of struggling, shunning the things that were bad, that he wanted to get rid of more than anything in his life, he had a whole new opinion of it. He, 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 what he saw initially as weakness and something to be, be moved out of the way that was getting in, a way, in the way of doing what God had called him to do, it really became the place where the strength of God flowed. And so instead of, instead of begging God to take it away anymore, he now embraced it, just like Esther the pattern is humility. God came to God, God, Paul came to God in fervent prayer and fasting and asked him, asked him for his direction. Then he submitted his will to it, that he, he got this new understanding of what was going on. He's like, okay, 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 I understand what we're doing now. So he submitted his will to that. Stop asking for him to change it. Change it. And as a result, he receives God's favor from an unlikely source. So we need to change our view of things. Remember from last week, we talked about Isaiah 40 a little bit. He's like, uh, you vigorous young men stumble badly, but those that wait upon the Lord gain new strength. It reminds us that our strength's not enough. Our human strength will fail us, not if, we, it will. And the truth is, if we keep holding on to our strength, relationally, financially, spiritually, emotionally, or ever how it manifests in your life, it is to short-circuit God's power and God's favor in your life. So, I mean, look at this verse again to wrap up. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I'm going to walk through a couple of Greek words here to let you see like, maybe this in a new light. And so, my grace. Grace, the word is charis, same word for favor. Okay? And we have heard this said so many times that God's grace... Uh, uh, God's grace is his unmerited favor. And we've heard that so many times. Uh, we, it doesn't even mean anything to us. But, uh, it, 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 but think about what it means to favor somebody, right? To give them aid or assistance, kindness, uh, to look. Uh, and all of that is kind of encompassed in this word, charis, which is grace. So my grace is sufficient. The word is archaeo, which means exactly enough. It means eliminating a barrier with an exactly enough effort. Uh, and then my grace is sufficient for power. That's dynamis. That's the word we get dynamite from. And it's almost always used in relationship to, a, uh, to an explosive uh, miracle. Uh, almost all the time. My grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected. The word is teleo, which means execute or to complete something. And then the last one, weakness. Astenea, which means brokenness or lacking strength. So there's a Greek word. I'll come back to this in, in a minute if you didn't get it all down. Uh, but so if we put the Greek words into this, my charis is archaeo for you, for my dynamis is made teleo and astenea. That's what it, you put those words right in there. And a very, very literal translation of this verse could go like this God's aid or assistance, that is his favor, is exactly enough to meet your every need for his explosive, miracle-working power is executed or completed in you when you are broken before him. Okay? God's aid or assistance, his favor, is exactly enough to meet your every need for his explosive, miracle-working power is executed or completed in you when you're broken before him. Okay? Brokenness, not, brokenness is not something that we hear a lot about or like to hear a lot about, but it means we've given up our control. And that the spirit of independence within us is rooted out. And when a child of God is being broken, our spirit's not destroyed, but, and it, but our will is brought into submission to the will of the Father so we can give instant obedience to him. And so that a brokenness makes us available to the Lord. It moves us to walking on our own path, to walking in concert with him. Once we saw things as obstacles, now become the vehicles to receive his gracious favor. Um, he never wants you to handle your kids or your marriage or your job or your relationships or the complicated, difficult things in your life on your own. He wants you to acknowledge that you are weak and in need of him. And he is ready and willing.
to make his strength, his power, exactly what you need for the moment. And that's what prayer and fasting is all about. Not necessarily getting what we want the way we want it. Prayer and fasting is about humility, submission, as a result, receiving God's favor to do his will. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that uh, we don't have to figure it all out. And that you give your Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to lead us to where you want us to be. God, help us realize that a lot of times we're the problem and being able to hear and do what you want us to do. So God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and heart to obey. For we pray in your mighty Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. We have groups tonight, and um, if there's not enough tables, you can get by, but it looks like you got a decent group. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, don't sit at a green table. That's right. <laughs> that, that's the way it is.